Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure is... The Echo of Death. Or Nick Carter and the Phantom Clue. No, no, please. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Hold him still. They're just like that. This has got to look right. No, I'll... I'll do anything you say. I'll forget everything I know. Only don't... <laughs> uh. All right. He's dead. Now, come on. Hello? Yes, this is Nick Carter speaking. A case? What kind of case? A disappearance? Well, that's hardly in my line. Uh... Oh, I see. Yes. Yes. Yes, I understand. All right, expect us late this afternoon. Did you get that on the extension, Patsy? I should say so. Echo Valley Lodge, private amphibian plane waiting for you at the airport. Come at once, never mind the fee. <laughs> who is this Howard Manstead who tosses money around like confetti? A well-known millionaire sportsman, Patsy. But um, wouldn't it be more to the point to ask about the man who's disappeared? Oh, you mean James Thurlow, the columnist. Why, he's... He... Hey, who is he, anyway? That's what you get for not reading the financial pages of the paper, Patsy. Well, come along. We've got to find a taxi and get to the airport. Well, aren't we going to take anything with us? Oh, yes, of course. I was forgetting. I thought you were. I'll need my new dress. We want but... Scubby. Call him and tell him to meet us at the airport. He knows Thurlow. They write for the same paper. But aren't we going oh, to... Oh, and say... one other thing, Patsy. Bring along volume three of the encyclopedia, E to H. Scubby Wilson and volume three of an encyclopedia. That's just what a girl needs for a visit to a millionaire's hunting lodge. <laughs> Though seldom visited because of its somewhat inaccessible location, Echo Valley is a natural freak of singular interest. I have friends you could say the same thing about, but the encyclopedia doesn't mention them. Quiet, Scabby. Let Patsy finish reading. Echo Valley is of great interest to scientists. Sounds occurring in certain areas of Echo Valley may be repeated as many as 13 times, echoing from cliff to cliff in gradually diminishing volume. Why do encyclopedias always use so many words to say so little? Hmm. That's what I wonder about newspaper reporters sometimes, too. So we'll change the subject? <laughs> what else does it say? That's all. Well, that's no help. Thurlow certainly wasn't carried off by an echo. Oh, he's probably just lost in the woods. In any case, I don't see why Manstead insisted on you coming out to look for him, Nick. You're no Indian guide. Patsy, if Thurlow isn't found alive, it may cost the public millions. Millions? Well, he's just a columnist, isn't he? Just a columnist? He's the smartest financial reporter in New York. And Thurlow's more than just a reporter, Patsy. In the financial column he writes, he sometimes tips the authorities off to big stock swindles and other kinds of financial skullduggery. Right. It was Thurlow who broke open the Nemo Bank scandal three years ago and sent the whole board of directors to prison. And for some time, Patsy, Thurlow has been hinting in his column that he was on the verge of revealing some kind of tie-up between certain politicians and uh, one or two big operators that would rob the public of millions. Well, then if anything happened to him now, before he's had a chance to tell anybody what he knew, the scheme would go through his schedule. Right. That's why he went to Echo Valley Lodge. Manstead, an old friend of his, invited him out so he could work in peace for a few weeks. Scubby. Huh? Is it true that Thurlow was on the verge of a nervous breakdown when he left? Oh, he was walking around in circles talking to himself, Nick. Hmm. He had almost all the dope he wanted, but he still hadn't got the name of the guy behind the whole scheme. He took along a whole bunch of records of stock transactions. He said they might give him the clue he needed. And, hey, look, ahead of us. Echo Valley. It is, isn't it, Nick? No doubt of it, Patsy. But look, that isn't any echo flying toward us. A plane. Nick, it's a plane flying up out of Echo Valley. Yes. Yes, it's a private amphibian. I thought this plane of Manstead's was the only one in these parts. Now, the pilot's seen us. Huh. He's turning out of our line of flight. 
suppose he wants to avoid us? I'll bet he doesn't want us to see his markings. He is trying to avoid us. Oh, pilot, swing over so we can get a look at that plane down there. Right, Mr. Carter. He knows we're trying to get closer to him. Look at him bank to avoid us. He's turned back. He's heading away from us now. A pilot, overtake that plane if you can. Yes, Mr. Carter. Say, isn't that the Manstead hunting lodge down there, right on the edge of the lake? Yes, Cubby, it is. But we're not going to land until we get some idea what that plane's up to. Look, he's diving straight down now. He's going to try to get away underneath us. Oh, he'll never make it. Those private planes aren't built. His wing is breaking off. Couldn't take the strain. He's heading straight for the ground if he hasn't got a parachute. Oh, but he has. Look, he's jumping. The other chute's opening. And there goes his plane into the trees. Well, that was a narrow escape. He didn't have more than 500 feet of altitude. Oh, he's come down on the top of that tall pine. He's caught there. See, his parachute won't come loose. Yes. Well, we'll have to land and rescue him. Besides, I want to know why he was so anxious to avoid having his plane identified. Oh, pilot. Yes, Mr. Carter? Land in the lake and taxi up as close as possible to the place that fellow came down. Yes, sir. Back in your face, Betsy. Oh. Well, aren't we almost there? Yes, there's the clearing. Just ahead. Only a few more steps. Oh, and they say exercise is good for you. Oh, there. There's his parachute. I think I can see him hanging among the branches. He's hurt or he'd call to us. Come on. His shroud lines are caught among the branches. I can see that much. Well, he's just, just dangling there. Yeah. Hey, you up there. Can you hear us? You all right? He doesn't answer. Look, I'll climb up and see if I can... No. Wait. What is it, Nick? Look at those shroud lines. They're... They're wrapped around his neck. Yeah. Look at the way his head is twisted to one side. Yes. His neck's broken. He's dead. What? Oh. When he landed in the tree, he got tangled in the lines and... I wonder... Nick, what do you mean? Look down at your feet, Scubby. Huh? Cigarette butt. Why, somebody must have been here before us. Maybe. But its position makes me think the cigarette was smoked by him up there. Oh, but that's impossible, Nick. It's been just about an hour, Scubby, since he crashed. He knew we'd come after him. So if he was hurt and couldn't get out of his chute harness, what would be more natural than for him to smoke a cigarette and wait to be rescued? But he... he's dead. Because somebody reached him before we did and murdered him. And so that's the story, Mr. Carter, as much as we know anyway. Thurlow just wandered away yesterday morning and never returned. Hmm, I see, Mr. Manson. And you don't think this mysterious airplane we met just before we reached here has any connection with Thurlow's vanishing? Well, I don't see how it could. But then, as I said, I haven't the slightest idea where the plane could have come from or who was flying it. Yeah. Now, let's go over the facts again, if you don't mind. Oh, of course not. Thurlow arrived here a week ago? Yes, with his wife. I had them flown in in my plane. They had the lodge to themselves with my permanent housekeeper to look after them. And you arrived yesterday? In the middle of the afternoon. But Thurlow wasn't here when you arrived? No, he'd already gone out. He told his wife he was taking his revolver along and would take pot shots at the trees and rocks. So you never actually saw him. That's right. The woodsman I employed to look after the property asked me to come and examine some trees he wanted to cut down. About sundown, I got back to the lodge and Thurlow still hadn't returned. Mrs. Thurlow was becoming worried. I ordered the floodlights we used for landing the plane at night, but he didn't show up. And then in the morning, you called me. Well, first I phoned the nearest forest ranger station. And after that, Mrs. Thurlow was so agitated, I had promised I'd send for you. Where is Mrs. Thurlow? I'd like to ask her a few questions. Well, she's sleeping now. She was up all night, and this morning the housekeeper gave her a sleeping tablet. Shall we wake her? No, 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 no not just now. There's still an hour of daylight left. I'd like to take a look around outside. Wraps up. Uh... I'll open it. Uh, Mr. Manstead. Johnny. What is it? His hat. 
We found it. Thurlow's hat? Where? Near the waterfall. Why, that's not far. It's only a mile from here. It's still light. Do you want to come with us and look for him, Mr. Carter? Yes, I think I do. Manstead, in that bush. But what in the world could Thurlow have been doing in here? This isn't a trail to the waterfall. It isn't a trail at all as far as I'm concerned. It's a jungle. It used to be a trail to an old one-room cabin, but there's no reason Thurlow would go there. Well, maybe if we yell, he'll hear us. He might be in there with a busted ankle or something. Go ahead and try, Scabby. Thurlow! Thurlow! Good gosh, will you listen to that? Well, that's one reason this is called Echo Valley. The cliffs around the waterfall down the trail make a perfect sounding board. Well, if he didn't hear that, he must be dead. If there's a cabin in there, we'd better take a look at it. Right. I don't see what in the world Thurlow could have come this way for, but maybe he did. Let's find out. Oh, there, between those two trees. See it? Oh, yes. It's only another 40 yards. Well, come on, then. Oh, Scubby. Wait. Well, sure, Nick. What is it? That bare patch of ground there. Those footprints. Thurlow's footprints. You sure, Scubby? Sure. I've seen those pointed shoes of his too often not to recognize the footprints any place. Come on, Nick. Um, yes, yes. I'm coming. Thurlow's a tall man, isn't he, Scubby? He's a tall man like I'm Henry Ford. He's about five feet five. Why? I thought it... Well, never mind. There's the cabin. Gosh, it doesn't look as if it had been opened in years. Well, it hasn't that I know of. But there are Thurlow's footprints going right up to the door. And somebody's opened the door recently. Look at these broken spider webs around the door jamb. And it won't open now. Here, let me try. It ought to open without any trouble. Yeah, but... Doesn't budge. <laughs> That's strange. Let's take a look through the window. The window's boarded over. The boards haven't been touched. I nailed the window up myself three years ago. Nobody came here since. And someone has come here. Thurlow. And he must be inside now. But the window hasn't been touched. And the door is barred on the inside. It looks bad. We'd better break the door down. Suppose we have old Johnny use his axe on it. That'll be quicker. Of course. Johnny, smash the door open for us. Stand back, please. That door was locked to stay locked. Starting to go. Yeah. That does it. It's open. If you don't mind, I'd like to go in first. Of course. Uh, it's dark inside. Here, take my flashlight. Thanks. There he is. Follow. He's... He's dead. He came here, bolted himself in, and shot himself with his own revolver. Yes, he's dead, all right. And it does look like suicide, doesn't it? (laughs) Now, now, Mrs. Thurlow. Jim couldn't have killed himself, Mr. Carter. He couldn't have. I'm sorry, Mrs. Thurlow. I wouldn't intrude on your grief if it wasn't necessary. Now, first of all, what kind of mood was your husband in yesterday morning just before he disappeared? He was very agitated. Agitated? Well, do you know any reason why he should have been? I I think he just found a clue to the identity of the man he was seeking. The one behind this plot to upset the stock market. Did he say who it was? No. No, he just said he'd stumbled on a clue. And he was so shocked he could hardly believe the evidence. That was why he went out into the woods. He wanted to be alone to think the matter through. Perhaps his notes will tell us what he found. Yeah, I thought of that, Nick. After Mrs. Thurlow woke up and I talked to her while you and Scubby were out with Mr. Manstead, we tried to read his notes. But they're in some kind of a shorthand that nobody can read but himself. I can make out a few words here and there, but not enough to help. Well, we'll have another try at it later. Uh, Please go on, Mrs. Thurlow. Well, that's almost all, Mr. Carter. Jim went out about ten in the morning. 
I stayed here in my room reading. About half an hour later, I thought I heard a shot. All of a sudden, I was terribly frightened. Frightened? Of what? I don't know. It was just a feeling. Then, then I heard the far-off echo of somebody hammering. It was... Oh, it, it sounded like somebody hammering down the lid of a coffin. And I'm positive it meant that Jim was dead. It's probably someone chopping down a tree, she heard Nick. Anyway, she went back to her reading and forgot about it. Then around one, men said from from the village, that's a little town about ten miles from the hills, for Johnny to come for him in the station wagon. Manstead phoned. Well, didn't he fly in by plane yesterday? Seems not. A plane was in New York getting a new propeller, so he took the night train. Is that so? Anyway, Johnny went to meet him. He got here about 2.30. The rest of the story is just the way he told it to us. Nick Thurlow must have killed himself. It just isn't any other answer. I wonder, Patsy. I wonder. <laughs> Yes, speaking. Did you get the dope I wanted? He was. And the plane? Then check every airfield within 50 miles of the city. Yes, I know it's a big order, but somebody's playing this game for big stakes. No, that's all. Call me back when you've learned something. Oh, uh... Oh, hello, Carter. I... I didn't know anybody was here in the library. I took the liberty of phoning New York. I was trying to check on that mysterious plane that we saw crash yesterday afternoon. I see. Did you learn anything? Nothing yet. You know, I have a theory about that plane, Carter. I'd be interested to hear it, Mr. Manstead. Well, we're only a hundred miles from the border, and in the past, planes engaged in smuggling aliens into this country have landed in this region. Now, I'm willing to wager this chap, who was so anxious to avoid being seen, was engaged in doing something like that. Hmm. Certainly sounds plausible. Nick! Oh, Nick! Oh, yes, Gubby. Oh, there you are. Oh, top of the morning to you, Mr. Manstead. Good morning. Say, I was looking for the two of you. Forest Ranger Thompson and two of his men are down at the landing waiting in your launch, Mr. Manstead. They want to get started down the lake to bring in the body of that flyer who... Uh, <clears throat> who was so unlucky when he bailed out of his plane yesterday. Uh, of course. Uh, you're coming with us, aren't you, Carter? I guess, indeed. I'm just as interested as you are to see if your theory turns out to be right. Oh, what about Patsy? Shall I go find her? No, oh, no, Scubby. She's staying here in the lodge with Mrs. Thurlow. They're going to spend the morning going over Thurlow's notes, trying to decipher them. Well, let's get going. I want to get back in time to phone a story to my paper. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid it's no use, Miss. Please, just call me Patsy. It's just impossible to read these notes of Jim's, Patsy. They're not only in his own shorthand, but most of them are in code, too. Here's something that seems as if it might mean something. See, it says, I can H-B it. H-B. Mm-hmm. Hardly believe. I can hardly believe it. Yes. Of course, that's what it means. And here's some more. It's clearer. Shall I tell Manstead what I know? The next line, better not. Instead, must get back to New York. Well, that's clear enough. But the next line, my life, M B N D. That doesn't mean anything to me. My life, M B N D. My life may be in danger. Oh. And then there's just one last sentence that he never finished. To think that the one man in the world, and that's all there is. Oh, oh, if it only finished. To think that the one man in the world, oh, who do you suppose he could have meant? I can't even make a guess. The one man. Mrs. Thurlow, what's that? Mrs. Thurlow, we're going to go and take a look at that cabin now while all the others are away. I have a theory, and we're going to find some evidence to prove it. It has to be there. It just has to be. Hello, Nick, my friend. 
Hey, what's troubling you? You've been sitting out here on this rock for an hour ever since we got back. Looking mean enough to bite your grandmother. Scubby, that poor devil of an aviator whose body we brought in was murdered. And Thurlow was murdered. And I can't prove it. But, Nick, couldn't you be wrong? The aviator certainly looked like a natural accident. And Thurlow, if I ever saw a case that looked more like suicide, well, I don't know where it was. Well, that's just it. The aviator, I can explain. Someone slipped through the woods, reached him before we did, climbed the tree he was caught in, and strangled him with the shroud lines in his parachute while pretending to help free him. But Thurlow, his own footprints leading into the cabin. The window boarded over and the door bolted on the inside. If somebody killed him, well, how did they get out? I don't know, Scubby. It isn't possible. And it was done. I'm going to break the... Hey, Scubby, what's that in your hand? Oh, just a shiny new nail I picked up somewhere. Somebody must have been fixing something. A nail? And Mrs. Farrow said she heard the echo of hammer blows the morning her husband died. Yeah, said they sounded like somebody hammering down the lid of a coffin. <laughs> they sure have imagination. But that's just what she did here. Huh? She heard the echoes of somebody nailing down the lid of a coffin. But there must be a clue. There must be. But we've been all over the cabin inside and out a dozen times now, Patsy. If there was anything here, we'd have found it. Mrs. Thurlow, somehow your husband was murdered here. And his body left inside this cabin so it would look like suicide. I'm going to find out how the murderer got out, leaving the door and window bolted, or or die. I'm afraid you're much more likely to die, Patsy. Oh, oh Mr. Manstead. Yes, Mr. Manstead. After we returned to the lodge and I learned the two of you had disappeared in this direction, I thought I'd better find out what you were up to. You? You killed my husband? Of course he did. Who else could your husband have meant by the one man in the world he'd never have believed guilty? But, but he was Jim's friend. That's what he wanted you to think. He pretended to be a friend so he could always keep checking what your husband learned. And he invited you both here so he could commit murder if he decided it was necessary. A very interesting theory. But I'm afraid I can't give you a chance to tell it to anyone else. Johnny! Right here, Mr. Manstead. Come inside and close the door. What are you going to do to us? He thinks he's going to kill us. He hasn't got that gun in his hand for fun. Johnny, the old mine shaft is close by. Now, if these two ladies out walking had the misfortune to stumble into it, it would be very tragic, wouldn't it? Lots of people fall down old mine shafts. So they do. And I'm afraid another such accident is about to happen. You can't get away with it, Mr. Manstead. Nick Carter won't let you. Oh, well, perhaps even clever Mr. Carter may have to have an accident. Help me silence him, Johnny. Quickly! No, no, Nick! Nick! Quiet! No! Quiet, I say! All right, now, Johnny, knock them both on the head and keep them quiet. All right, right Manstead, let go of her. You, Carter. Nick, look out, his gun. Drop it, Manstead, or I... Johnny, kill him. Kill him. Johnny, put down that axe or I'll shoot. Yes, sir. He... He's dead. I'm afraid so. That's it. Uh, either of you hurt? No, Nick, you came just in time. But how... How did I know Manstead was a murderer? I knew that from the time we found this cabin. But it took an echo to prove it. The echo, Mrs. Thurlow, that you said sounded like someone hammering. But, but I don't understand. Scubby's bringing Ranger Thompson. As soon as they get here, I think I'll be able to clear up a lot of mysteries. <laughs> Manstead was behind the plot that Thurlow uncovered. He invited Thurlow here in order to find out what he knew. He discovered Thurlow had evidence which would tell him the truth, and therefore decided to eliminate Thurlow. But, Mr. Carter, Manstead didn't get here until after Thurlow was dead. He came by train. And... Oh, Ranger Thompson's right, Nick. He appeared to come by train. Actually, he flew in the night before, in a plane whose pilot was used to taking big fees for keeping his mouth shut. That was the plane that we saw crash. Something delayed it from leaving in time to avoid us, and in the pilot's effort to keep away from us, well, we all know what happened. But, Nick, why was the pilot murdered? That was Johnny's work. As soon as Thurlow saw the crash, he sent Johnny by a secret trail through the woods to make sure the pilot didn't live to talk. Otherwise, his murder scheme would have collapsed. Isn't that right, Johnny? Yes, sir. So Manstead flew here the night before he murdered Thurlow. In the morning when Thurlow left the house, he and Johnny waylaid him. Is that it, Nick? That's it, Patsy. They brought him to the cabin here. 
Manstead put on his victim's shoes and made a trail of footprints. I see. Then they killed Thurlow, put his shoes back on him, and left him in the locked cabin. A clear case of suicide. But Manstead made a mistake there. His footprints were too far apart. They were the steps of a tall man. When Scubby said Thurlow was a short man, I began to suspect. Well, it certainly does sound plausible, Mr. Carter. But you've still got to convince me Manstead could get out of that cabin and leave the door barred from the inside. Make it good, Nick. Johnny knows the answer. You all remember that Mrs. Thurlow said she heard the echo of hammer blows. You mean she really did hear someone hammering? Exactly. This is a small cabin with a roof lightly nailed in place. Now look up there. What's that flashing in the sun? Looks like nail heads. Somebody's hammered new nails into that roof all along this side. Nick, is that the clue I was looking for? That's the clue you were looking for. Scubby and I saw it yesterday, but we weren't smart enough to know what it meant. Here, I'll take Johnny's axe and push the blade in under the eaves and pry upward like that. What's it? The whole roof's lifting up. Well, blow me down. Manstead and Johnny pried up the flimsy roof before they killed Thurlow. Then leaving the door barred, they climbed out. And Johnny nailed the roof back into place. Right. So they were hammering the lid on the coffin, so to speak. Thurlow's coffin. And due to the curious echoing qualities of the rocks, the sound carried to the lodge. And Mrs. Thurlow heard it. I didn't think it meant anything until I noticed the nail Scubby picked up someplace. The nail Johnny must have dropped. And then I remembered the hammering sound Mr. Thurlow spoke of. And suddenly the whole thing was clear. Well, it sure wouldn't have been clear to me if you hadn't explained it, Mr. Carter. I certainly wouldn't ever have worked it out with just an echo for a clue. Oh, but that was an unusual echo. Remember how cleverly it answered? And when it comes to answers, Scuppy, Nick Carter is the man who gets them. <laughs> This was another strange experience of Nick Carter called The Echo of Death, or Nick Carter and the Phantom Clue. The curious adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, are brought to you every Monday night at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. We'll let Nick himself tell you about next week's story. What'll it be about, Nick? I call it Death Across the Tracks. It began with the murder of a detective. A railroad detective who lived in the station alongside the tracks. He was working on a case, but he had it only partly solved when he was murdered. And I picked it up from there. I'll say you did, Nick. You almost picked up a few bullets into the bargain the way the victim did. (laughs) When you called it death across the tracks, you were right in more ways than one. This sounds more and more intriguing. And how did it wind up, Nick? Well, we'll tell you that next week. But I can say this much. I had a stroke of luck. Nick always calls it luck when he uses foresight. Good night, folks. (laughs) Yes, good night, folks. And good night, Patsy and Nick. In tonight's strange adventure, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark. Patsy was impersonated by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at half past nine o'clock Eastern Wartime, listen to another curious adventure of Nick Carter entitled Death Across the Tracks. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the midnight train. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. And here's a special note. Beginning next week, Nick Carter will be heard over most of these same stations on Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. The Cisco Kid will be presented on Tuesdays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. This week's curious adventure is... Murder in the Crypt. Or Nick Carter and the Jekyll God. There. 
You'll never know that I came here this time any more than you did the other time that I was here. <laughs> Those footsteps coming this way. It, it's Anubis. Anubis. Oh, it can't be. I am Anubis. Guardian of the dead. No, no. I must be dreaming. I am Anubis, the jackal god. But you're not... No. No, no. from Abydos. Condition good. Come in. Are uh, you Dr. Waldemar? I am. I'm Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. You called me about a museum guard who disappeared? Of course, of course. It's about Shelby, the chief attendant here at the Egyptian Museum. Uh, where and when did this Shelby disappear, Doctor? He failed to report to me as usual before leaving last night. And the guards on the door say he did not leave the building. Mm. We've hunted everywhere for him, but we haven't found him. Oh, you've hunted everywhere, have you? Yes, Lieutenant. Everywhere except in the crypt of Snefru. Uh, the, the what of who? The crypt of Snefru, an Egyptian king of the fourth dynasty. Mm. And where is this crypt? In the basement? No, it's on the second floor, directly above this office. Mm. It was installed especially for Professor Glidden, the archaeologist. He alone has access to the crypt. It has a special lock on the door. Oh, you mean he has the only key, huh? Precisely. I called Professor Glidden's apartment a while ago, but he did not answer. I presume he is on his way down here now. I hope he can shed some light on this mystery. Hmm. Nick, isn't this the Egyptian museum across the road? Yes, Patsy, it is. Never been in it? Mm -mm. Looks too much like a mausoleum for me. <laughs> Are we going in to look at the mummy? That, Patsy, depends entirely upon Professor Glidden. Who's he? That bearded man who is beckoning to us from the doorway of the museum. Oh, I see him. Is he a client of yours? Yes. He phoned just before you arrived at the office this morning. What does he want? That, I don't know, Patsy. Suppose we join him and find out. You say, Professor, that the Archaeological Society gave Dr. Waldemar the money to complete the museum. Yes, Mr. Carter. Mm -hmm. Provided that he would install a special crypt where uh, I could place the relics from the tomb of King Snefru for examination and classification. So the crypt is officially your property? For the present, yes. When my work is finished, it will be open to the public. I see. And uh, just where do I come in? I want you, Mr. Carter, to be present when we search the crypt. So there will be no question that Shelby is not there. This is Dr. Waldemar's office? It is. Oh, good morning, Bidden. Uh, this is Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. Hello there, Lieutenant Riley. <laughs> Hello, Hello, Nicholas Lieutenant. Carter and Patsy, too. We haven't seen each other for a long while. Uh, now, don't tell me that you're looking for this man Shelby, too, Nick. I am, Riley. At the request of Professor Glidden. Oh. So since Dr. Waldemar has asked you to perform the same service, Riley, why don't we work together? We're glad to, Nick. Fine. Oh, you wouldn't object if Lieutenant Riley helped search the crypt, would you, Professor? Not at all. Well, Riley, shall we adjourn to the crypt? Right, Nick. The crypt is on the second floor, right over this office. Come, come, Glidden, unlock the door. This is an intricate lock, Waldemar. It takes careful handling of the key. There. Uh, where's the light switch, Professor Glidden? Uh, just inside the door to the right. Very well, I'll... There. <laughs> well, would you look at that now? <laughs> I never saw a statue to resemble that beast. The body of a man and the head of a dog it has. I'd call it the head of a jackal, Riley. Mm -hmm. Am I right, Professor Glidden? You are, Mr. Carter. A bronze statue is a life-size figure of Anubis, the jackal god. Anubis was the guardian of the dead. 
And his statue was set at the entrance of ancient tombs to keep out thieves. And the jackal face is enough to scare anyone away. Come along, Riley. Let's look around inside the crypt. Okay. Well, here's a mummy case, which I suppose contains old King's nephew in person. Quite right, Mr. Carter. Yeah, now here's the old boy's throne. <laughs> it looks like the original Morris chair. Let's see. There's nobody hiding under it, Riley. Okay, Nick. See, now look over there. In the alcove over behind the statue. Now what is it? An ancient Egyptian bathtub? That, Riley, is a sarcophagus. Huh? A stone coffin. The one that once contained the mummy case we just saw. Gosh, now it's a big thing now, ain't it? What's all this crazy writing on the front of it? Those are hieroglyphics, Riley. Inscriptions about old King Snapper. Oh. What's inside this thing, Nick? Oh, probably nothing now, Riley. Just the big oak. Now, what is it, Nick? This sarcophagus is not empty, Riley. Huh? Shelby's in it. Oh. And he's dead. <laughs> Once again, Lieutenant Riley, I must reply that I know nothing of this matter. As I've told you, I scarcely knew Shelby. Now, look here, Riley. Your evidence against my client is purely circumstantial. Uh, Nick, it's a disgrace to the memory of old Sim Carter, the way his one and only son tries to misinterpret the bald facts. The bald facts in this case is this, Riley. You have no proof that Professor Glidden even came to this museum last night. Look, all I want is one more bit of circumstance, Nick. Dr. Waldemar, can you think of anything else that might be... Will interest him in this case? Now, let me see. Look, Nick. A strange woman coming down the corridor toward us. Ah, she looks like something revived from ancient Egypt. She walks like a cat. You can't hear the slightest footstep. Quiet, Patsy. She's stopping close enough to overhear us. Uh, Lieutenant Riley. Huh? I have it. Ask the professor just how he knew that Shelby was missing when he telephoned Carter this morning. I yeah. shall answer that question, Dr. Waldemar. Who, say, where did you come from? Who is this lady, Dr. Waldemar? Allow me to introduce Madame Dakla, our librarian. Oh, you have a library in this museum? Oh, yes. The library is in the other wing near the elevator. I was the person who informed Professor Glidden that Shelby was missing. I telephoned him this morning. After the search began. And Professor Glidden telephoned me, Riley, asking me to come here to protect his interests, which I have so far tried to do. Mm. Madame Dakla comes from Cairo. She's an Egyptian, well-versed in ancient lore and legend. Madame Dakla, do you really believe those old Egyptian legends? I must believe them. With my own eyes, I have seen the living Anubis walk through the corridors of this museum. But that statue couldn't possibly get out of a lost crypt. To Anubis, anything is possible. It is his duty to guard the treasure in the crypt. What treasure, Madame Dakla? The treasure that is found in the tomb of every Egyptian king. Anubis, the avenging jackal god, knew that the museum god Shelby sought the treasure. So Anubis sought Shelby and killed him and put his body in the crypt as a warning. Anubis is all-powerful. You mean you've actually seen this, uh, this jackal god walking around this museum recently? Anubis, the guardian of the dead, leaves the crypt of King Snefru and prowls these corridors every night. I have seen him do it. Gosh. That will be all, Madame Dakla. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Nick, suppose we go through that crypt again and see what we can learn. An excellent suggestion, Riley. Patsy. Suppose you go around and wait in the library with Madame Delka. We'll join you there later. Ah, Nick. This crypt is as solid as a rock. We've tested every inch of floor and walls and ceiling here. Yes, Riley, every spot we've tapped seems to be solid stone or concrete. Uh, Nick, suppose we check those measurements again, eh? Oh, no use in that, Riley. The room's 30 by 30, with four feet out for the door on one side and eight feet out for the alcove on the other. Mm. Uh, how big did you say that sarcophagus was, Nick? It's eight feet long and six feet wide. Practically the same size as the alcove it's standing in. Mm. And it's four feet, six inches high. Why? Well, I was just thinking, Nick. That's an awful big chunk of rock there. Well, Professor Glidden says this one weighs over 1,100 pounds. Uh, it's over half a ton. 
This goes to show that the floor in this crypt must be solid to support such a weight day in and day out. There's an answer to this case somewhere, Riley. Mm. Even if I don't know yet where it is. Come on. Let's get back to the office. Uh, if I'd followed my better judgment, I'd have locked Professor Glidden in a jail cell first. It wouldn't be wise just yet, Riley. Uh, you're wrong there, Nick. And I'll tell you why. This door here is the only way in and out of that crypt. And this key... The only key there is now belonged to Professor Glidden. Riley, I want to learn the motive behind Shelby's murder. There were some strange things going on around this museum. Three ancient anklets, one job doing. Come in, come in. Oh, it's you, Mr. Carter. Miss Bowen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, are you convinced that only Glidden could have entered that crypt upstairs? I never like to accept the obvious, Dr. Wallabar. Oh, there goes the closing bell. I must put these Egyptian relics back in the vault. Oh, we're right ahead. A large vault, that is, Dr. Waldemar. Yes. The museum requires a large vault. I have this one built here in the wall, especially. Was it included in the original plans for the museum? Well, no, not exactly. This wing of the building was still unfinished when the architect died. In completing it, we made some minor changes. I see. Doctor, do you think Madame Dacla... You must excuse me for a few minutes, Carter. I must speak to the attendants before they leave. It was one of poor Shelby's duties. It will only take a few minutes. By the way, Patsy. Hmm? There's something on Waldemar's desk that should interest you. You mean that odd-looking jar? Mm-hmm. It contains some ancient Egyptian perfume, he said. Hmm. Smells like roses. Very strong. You better put it in the vault, Patsy. Waldemar must have overlooked it. Can you smell it, Nick? Powerful stuff. Yes, I can smell it all right. Put it in one of the shelves in the vault. Oh. What's the matter, Patsy? I just tripped on a small step at the front of the vault. You didn't spill any of that priceless perfume, did you? Oh, I'm afraid... Oh, yes, I did spill a few drops of it, Nick. Well, don't tell Waldemar. Oh, I hear him coming. Come out of the vault and look innocent. Okay. Well, Carter, another day is done. Oh, if you please stand away from the vault, Miss Bowen. I should like to close the door. Thank you. By the way, Doctor... Was there any treasure buried with King Sneferu? Probably. It was the custom. But it is also probable that such treasure was stolen centuries ago. Well, isn't Glidden interested in the matter of treasure? Possibly. But he's more interested in translating the hieroglyphics on the sarcophagus. Hmm. Well, Patsy, I must be going. You must be going? You mean you're going to leave me here in the museum? Only for a little while. I want you to go back to the library and have a talk with Madame Dacla, Patsy. Talk about what? I'll tell you that while we're walking to the other wing. Good night, Dr. Waldemar. Good night, Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter isn't interested in ancient manuscripts, Madame Dacla. He wants to see the architect's plans for this museum. Oh, but he should ask Dr. Waldemar for those. I don't think Dr. Waldemar has them. Mr. Carter wants the original plan. I shall be glad to see if I can find them for you. I shall try the file cabinet by the door. Well, they're not under A for architect. And they are not under B for building plans either. I shall try under M. Mm. Museum plans. What's that clumping sound out in the corridor? Yes, yes, here they are. In this folder. Plans for Egyptian museum to be erected Look, in the... Look, coming through the door. Anubis. Welcome, Anubis. Anubis gives no greeting to those who defy him. I have never defied you, Anubis. You have sought the treasure that I got. Never, never. I have always... <gasps> Let go of here, whoever you are. Let go. Away, away, you are. Hey, hey, now, what new mischief is going on here, Nick? O'Reilly, a dozen times. Huh? Patsy was just going to tell me. Who was it took Madame Dacla away, Patsy? It was somebody, somebody who looked like Anubis, the jackal god. What? 
Really, Nick? Madame Dacla had the plans of the museum in her hand. And they're gone, too. Nick, this time we're going to look in that crypt upstairs first. Come on. Find that light switch now, Nick. Right, Riley. Yeah, there she is, laying right at the feet of that that creature Anubis there. You mean the statue of Anubis, Riley? Uh, it may be a statue now, Nick, but I am near to believing that the thing comes alive when it chooses. Madame Dacla alive? Oh, oh, she... She, she's still breathing, Patsy. Oh, thank goodness. What do you make of it, Nick? She's oh. been drugged, Riley. Quick, get her over to the door where the air is pressure. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Ah, she's coming around now. Where, where am I? You're all right, Madame Dacla. Oh, but I am, I am in the crypt now. And the last I knew, I, I was in the library. I knew it. I knew steel doors are no barrier to Anubis. Uh, help her outside, Patsy, so, so I can lock the door here. You lean on me, Madame Dacla. But I tell you, it is useless to lock that door. Anubis can pass through all barriers. Maybe so, but Professor Glidden can't. Come on, Madame Dacla, I'll take you back to the library. Then I'm going to put the professor in jail where I can keep my eye on him. From now on, there'll be no Patsy. Hmm? When Riley opened the crypt just now and found Madame Dacla, did you notice the peculiar fragrance in the place? I must have been too excited to notice it, Nick. What was it like? It was the perfume of roses, Patsy. Musty, ancient roses. You should have recognized it. You mean... It was like the perfume from the bottle I spilled in Waldemar's office? Yes, Patsy. It smelled exactly the same. I admit nothing, Lieutenant Riley. I can't tell you how either Shelby or Madame Dacla got into the crypt. It's like I've been trying to tell you, Clinton. It's very simple. You had two keys, but you only gave me one. And as I've been telling you, Lieutenant Riley, there was no duplicate key. Stay out. I'm busy here. I said stay... Hello, Riley. <sighs> Hello, Glidden. So it's you again, Mr. Nicholas Carter. Well, I don't care whether Professor Glidden is your client or not. We're not releasing him. I don't want him released, Riley. I just want to ask him a few questions. Tell me, Professor Glidden, when you sent those relics of King's nephew to the Egyptian Museum, did Dr. Waldemar have any chance to examine them? Why, no. They were all heavily boxed and crated. That is, everything except the sarcophagus. That was handled separately. Waldemar installed the sarcophagus in the crypt before I arrived. I see. I, I seem to recall that Shelby helped him set it up. The boxes and crates were all upstairs when I got back. But I opened them alone and set up everything myself, including the statue. That's all I wanted to know. I'm sorry, Professor, that you'll have to spend the night here. But I hope to arrange your release by morning. All right, Sergeant. Take the professor to his cell. Yes, sir. Come along, Professor. Say, Riley. Mm. Will you do something for me? Why should I? Why shouldn't you? You'll learn something yourself. And that's always a help in a murder case. Mm, all right, Nick. When can I lose? Fine. Pick up Patsy. She has all my notes. And you may need them. And both of you go to the crypt. Where will you be, Nick? I have to attend to another matter first. Now, listen carefully, Riley. Mm -hmm. Here's what I want you to do. When you get to the... How long have we been in this crypt, Lieutenant Riley? Oh, it's about 15 minutes, Patsy. If you didn't have a luminous dial on your watch, I'd say it was hours. Why did Nick say that we should stay here in the dark? <laughs> You'll have to ask Nick that when he gets here, Patsy. Where did Nick say he was going? Well, no. It might be that he's calling on Madame Dacla. What? <laughs> oh, it's just a questioner, you understand. Oh, Riley, of all the ridiculous notions. <laughs> well, Dacla's boyfriend, Anubis, is right here beside us, Patsy. Do you see it? Yeah, this statue of Anubis must be solid bronze, Patsy. If nothing happens here, something will happen when I find Mr. Nick Carter. Only ten minutes more, Patsy. I'm getting so used to this darkness, I can see the sarcophagus plainly. It looks so big. Yeah, it is big. It's almost... What's that? I don't know. It sounds as if something was happening at last. 
Riley. Hey, what is it, Patsy? You, no, no, you're not getting hysterical now, are you? Riley, I smell something. The perfume of roses. And it's getting stronger. Now, what is the perfume of roses to do with all this here? Riley, look. Look at that sarcophagus. Patsy, what we're looking at can't be happening here. Oh, but it is. That sarcophagus is rising straight up in the air. And I've always said that, that, that seeing was believing. Look. I see what's doing it, Riley. You, you, you can't tell me that, that anything that will make a stone coffin weigh, weigh in half a ton go floating up in the air five feet off the floor, Patsy. It's on top of an elevator, Riley. Uh, an elevator? Sure, that's what's lifting it. Well, glory be. You're right, Patsy. That's what that rumbling sound was. Riley. Yeah. The man coming out of the elevator with a flashlight. Wait till I draw my gun, Patsy. I'll fix it. You're too late, Riley. Uh -huh. I have you covered. It's Dr. Waldemar. Why... Riley, that elevator is the vault from Waldemar's office. Quite right, Miss Bowen. I have you both covered. Don't try anything, either of you. Well, what would you be trying, Waldemar? There will be two new victims in this vault, Lieutenant Riley. Uh, two fools who, like Shelby, found out too much. But I'm sorry it isn't three. Nick Carter would be a welcome addition. You really mean that, Waldemar? Nick, where are you? Carter, how did you get here? I've been waiting for you in King Snepru's sarcophagus. And now, if you... I'll kill you first, Carter. I doubt that. <laughs> okay, Patsy. Look out, Patsy! He's knocking over that statue! It's falling over! <laughs> She'll be along any minute now, Patsy. He called me at the hospital and asked they asked me to meet him here outside the crypt in 15 minutes. Said he wanted to examine the elevator in the crypt. Was Waldemar dead, Nick? No, Patsy. I only wounded him. He knocked himself out when he staggered against the statue of Anubis. Waldemar made a complete confession when he recovered consciousness. He's admitted that he was hunting for the king's treasure and wanted to find it before Professor Glidden finished translating the hieroglyphics. And he was using the elevator to make secret trips between his office and this crypt. Exactly, Patsy. When Waldemar completed the new wing of the museum, he modified the original plans and put his office at the end of the first floor corridor. Then he built this crypt on the second floor, right over his office. Evidently, the elevator was already installed, and Waldemar brought the sarcophagus up on top of it. And there was a sarcophagus standing in an alcove that was really the elevator shaft. Mm -hmm. The elevator itself became the vault in Waldemar's office. He disguised it with shelves and loaded them with curios. But it was still an elevator. And you think Shelby found out about it? Shelby must have helped Waldemar arrange things, since it was more than a one-man job. And then later, Shelby decided to look for the treasure on his own. Apparently. Waldemar confessed that he murdered Shelby for those very reasons and left the body in the crypt to blame the crime on Professor Glidden. And Waldemar put Madame Dakla in the crypt so Glidden would be blamed again. Exactly. But he didn't have to kill Dakla. She knew nothing, you see. He merely grabbed Dakla in order to get the original plans of the museum. Here comes the professor now, Nick. Oh, hello, Professor. Right on time, I see. I was so glad to find you here, Carter. I, I wanted you to be here when I examined the crypt in the elevator. I want no more surprises. Well, I don't think anything else is going to happen up here, Professor, but I'll be glad of the chance to do a little extra looking around myself. Oh, there's that Anubis again. He's on his face this time. It was quite clever of Waldemar to disguise himself as Anubis. He really did resemble the statue. Well, look, Nick. Where, Patsy? There at the statue lying on the floor. Uh, why, the head is completely turned around. Yes, the fall must have knocked it loose. Oh, give me a hand with it, Professor. We'll set it up again. Oh, certainly, Carter. Uh, it's pretty heavy, but... Yes, it is. It... What? Gold. what? Gold! Oh, Nick, is it real? I imagine it is, Miss Bowen. Why, this must be the treasure of old King Snuffroos. So that's where the royal treasure was hidden. Valdemar must have looked everywhere except in the head of this statue. So Anubis was really the keeper of the treasure. Well, congratulations, Professor. And I hope this discovery makes up for all your troubles. It does indeed, Mr. Carter. I shall now be able to visit Egypt again. just one problem that still bothers me. And I suppose, as usual, that the problem represents the crux of the whole case. It does. When I put that jar of perfume on the shelf, did you already know that the vault was an elevator? I did, Patsy. The elevator floor wasn't quite level. That's why you tripped as you went into the vault. But of course. But, Nick, what made you think it was an elevator in the first place? It's quite simple, Patsy. 
There had to be an elevator to take the sarcophagus up to the crypt on the second floor. But Nick, there's an elevator in the other wing of the museum. They could have taken the sarcophagus up that way and wheeled it across to the crypt. Patsy, how large is the sarcophagus? Well, it's eight feet long and six feet wide and four and a half feet high, didn't you say? Mm-hmm. And how wide is the door to the crypt? Four feet, according to your measurement. Exactly. Now, Patsy, do you think you could put a sarcophagus four feet six inches high through a door only four feet wide? Of course not, Nick. Of course not, Patsy. Not even Dr. Waldemar could do it. Up through the alcove was the only way. Waldemar probably hoped that no one would think to compare the size of the door to the size of the sarcophagus. And nobody did, except Nick Carter. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called Murder in the Crypt, or Nick Carter and the Jackal God. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick and Patsy, what about our story for next week? Well, next week's story is full of action, isn't it, Patsy? Action is right. You see, Nick investigated a murder on a lonely place called Skull Island. Yes, and there were only four people on the island who could have committed the crime. But it took a model of a clipper ship and a sea serpent to find out who the murderer was. It also took Nick Carter and a smart piece of deduction on his part to work out the answer. But what did a sea serpent have to do with the murder? Well, we'll tell you all about that next week. In the meantime, I'm glad I don't have to say sarcophagus again. So long. <laughs> so long, everybody. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by John Clark, Patsy by Helen Choke. The story was written for Nick Carter by Walter Gibson. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled Murder on Skull Island, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Sea Serpent. <laughs> this story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. <laughs>out you go. This is it. This is what, Nick? A studio of magnificent pictures of which Joseph Stone is the owner and director. Well, there goes another illusion. I thought movie studios were all bright lights and glamour. This place looks like a stage set for the deserted village. Well, it's been locked up for the past ten years or so. Oh. Well, that's funny. The gate's locked. And that's our cue to turn around and go home again. You've got a nice, tasty jewel robbery waiting for you to solve back in town, and you should be working on that. Instead of being way out here at the end of nowhere, playing around a forgotten movie studio. I guess I'll have to pick the lock. Okay, if you must. Patient Patsy will bear with your little game. This is no game, Patsy. Well, what do you mean? The house of Lulu Doré, the star of Stone's new picture, was broken into last night while she was at a dance. She was wearing her jewels, including the famous emeralds. Fortunately, though, nothing was stolen. There. There we are. All right, Patsy, go ahead. Huh. Seems funny there isn't a gatekeeper around. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Well, I guess they haven't got a full staff for the studio, considering they moved back from Hollywood just to do this one show. Why did they do that, Nick? Oh, Doray had a run of the pay contract for the show she's doing on Broadway and couldn't go west. Hey, there, where do you think you're going? Oh, so there is a door, uh, Gateman. I am looking for Mr. Stone's office. Well, you can't see him. I'm afraid you don't understand. I'm Nicholas Carter. Mr. Stone's expecting me. I'm taking my orders from Lieutenant Riley of the Metropolitan Police. He says to admit no one. Riley? 
What's he doing here? Investigating the murder. Murder? I thought you said robbery, Nick. What murder? Come on, get out of here. I got my orders. Come on, Patsy. Let's find Riley or Joe Stone. Hey! You can't do that. Come back here. It's all right. I'll explain to the police. Hurry, Patsy. Hurry. What, what is this, Nick? Shall I plan to find out right now? And I take it this fellow Boyd who's been killed is a fairly unimportant chap, eh, Mr. Well, Stone? Well, yes, he, he was just a darn good electrician. Oh, doesn't seem to be any connection between his murder and the attempted robbery of Miss Doré. Well, no, there doesn't. Is Lieutenant Riley here now? Yes, yes, he's over on stage five. It's that building over there. Do you want me to come with you? Yes, I wish you would, Mr. Stone. There may be points I'd like to ask you about. Well, I'd be glad to help, of course, if I can help. There's one thing I don't understand, Mr. Stone. You say Boyd was shot in the back with a poisoned arrow from a blowgun. It's an odd weapon. It should be fairly easy to trace. You don't have to trace it very far, Mr. Carter. The blowgun and the arrow were mine. Yours? Yes, well, you see, 11 years ago, I tried to do a picture about a voodoo witch doctor who used the blowgun in it. I don't suppose you remember the picture, Mr. Carter. It was called the Voodoo Curse. Oh, yes, yes, I do. You had a bit of trouble over it, I believe. A bit of trouble? It practically drove me into bankruptcy. I'd imported a real voodoo witch doctor from Haiti, and he put a curse on the whole studio. Oh, come now, Stone. You don't really believe that. I don't know what I believe anymore. Eleven years ago, we had fires, we had explosions, we had mysterious thefts. We, we had just about everything. It got so that everybody was scared to work here. I had to close the studio, and, and now we have a murder. Why should the witch doctor put a hex on you? Oh, I had an argue with him, though, with a salary of some sort. He, he swore he'd break me, and he almost did. Now, here, this is stage five here. Well, well, Nicholas Carter. Hi, Riley. <laughs> and Patsy. Hello. Well, what might you be doing here? He's come to help you, Lieutenant. Well, that's very obliging of him, I'm sure. Say, was that a crack? Why, of course not. Well, let's get to work. Riley, where was the body found? Right over there by that door, Nick, where the chalk marks are. Hmm. I wonder what he was doing way over here. He, he was setting up the stage, as I told you. But all his equipment's over there, clear across the set. Riley. How was he facing when he died? He was lying on his face with his head towards that door, Nick. Shot in the back, wasn't he? Yep. We figured from the angle of the arrow that the blowgun fellow must have been sitting up there on that catwalk when he killed him. Mr. Stone, what's behind that door that Boyd was heading for? Well, special electrical equipment, I believe, for special effects. Would Boyd have known that? Well, yes, of course. He worked on this stage years ago. He, he probably would have remembered. That's it, then. He was going into that room to see if he could find some special equipment he needed. That accounts for his being way over here. And you think there was something in there the killer didn't want him to see, Nick? Right, Riley. Let's go in. Just locked, Nick. Oh, Stone, uh, give me your keys, will you? Keys? I, I, I have no keys for these rooms. Well, did Boyd have any? Well, I believe he had borrowed the caretaker set. Riley, did you search the corpse? Of course I did, Nick. No keys? No keys. I, I can get a locksmith out from the village. What? You have no duplicates? Well, the place has been locked up so long. I, I never expected to come back here was trying to sell it, as a matter of fact. Pick the lock, Nick. This seems to be your day for doing that. Just what I'm going to do, Patsy. I'll, I'll get you more light. Oh, he doesn't need light. He can see in the dark, practically. No, you don't have to see to pick a lock. There. There. And there. That's it. Now we'll get a look at what your killer didn't want Boyd to see. Here, here's the light switch. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Don't crowd in like that. Uh-huh. Look. Footprints. Footprints in the dust. Golly, Nick, there goes your theory. Boyd was here before he was killed and took out whatever it was he wanted. Well, it was a cute theory while it lasted. Maybe it's still a cute theory, as you call it. Uh, all we have to do now, Nick, is to measure the prints and see if they're Boyd's or not. They're not. How do you know? Yeah, you haven't even seen see the body. These prints were made by leather sole shoes, right, Riley? Well, yeah, you're right, but... And Boyd was wearing rubber soles. How do you know he was, Nick? Correct me if I'm wrong, Stone. Don't all technicians on the soundstage wear rubber-soled shoes to kill any noise that the sound tracks might pick up? Well, you're right, Carter, they do. Now, those leather sole prints mean that it wasn't Boyd, but our friend the murderer who used the keys he took from Boyd to get in here. And they lead to that crate. Let's see what's in it. No, don't walk on the footprints. We need them as evidence. I'll wager you'll find the crate empty. The murderer didn't just walk over to it, look in and walk out again. Oh, no. He took away everything he didn't want Boyd or anyone else to find. You're right, Nick. The crate is empty. Uh, shall we search the room, Nick? Well, what's the point in that? If there was anything here. It's gone by now. Murderer seen to that. I wonder what was in this crate. I wonder if... Help! It... Help! No! Oh, 
Oh, Nick, the poor kid. What is it, Carter? Another murder. Another? Good Lord. Can you identify him, Stone? Why, it, it's Bill Daly, our camera punk. Camera punk? What's that? Oh, it's studio slang for assistant to the camera. Hey, oh. you, you people all run too fast for me. Hey, oh, what's up here? See for yourself, Riley. Well, good gosh, another murder. Uh, and it looks from his position as if he was just coming out of that door over there. Well, that's funny. Both he and Boyd... Any idea what he was doing around here, Stone? Uh, yes, I, I sent him over here myself about an hour ago to look in that warehouse, see if there was any of that old photographic equipment we could remodel and use. Priorities, you know. Daly was very clever at that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a mean-looking knife he's got sticking in his throat, Nick. Knife? Good Lord. Well, what is it, Mr. Stone? That, that knife... It's from that same voodoo picture. There seem to be a few too many of those old props hanging around. Are there any more? Yes, there's a complete stock of weapons. Everything we used in that confounded picture. The voodoo curse? Yes. I rather think I'd like to see that film, Stone. Is there a copy of it around here anyplace? Well, as much as we ever shot of it, it was never finished, you know. Could you run it off for me? Well, certainly I will. I'll go arrange it now. Thanks. Well, Nick, what do you think? I'm not sure... Any opinions yourself? Yes. My money's on Stone's doing it. Stone? Why in the world would he do it? Well, I don't know. I haven't figured out the reason for it yet. But he acts kind of funny. Nervous, sort of. And he keeps talking about the place maybe being haunted. Oh, good heavens, Riley. Who wouldn't be nervous with all this murder going around? I know I am. Well, take the weapons, Nick. They all belong to him. But other people could have access to them, Riley. After all, Stone hasn't been here for over ten years. Mm. And there's something more important you've overlooked, Riley. Mm. What's that, Nick? How did Stone manage to throw that knife at Daly while he was with us? How do I know? We were all so busy looking at that star room on the set, he, he could have sneaked up. By golly, I'll bet that's how he did do oh, it. Oh, that's Stone beckoning to us. You want to go to see the movies, Riley? I got better things to do, Nick. I'm going to search this joint. How about you, Betsy? Sure thing. But why do you want to see it? I'm not sure, Patsy. But I've got sort of a hunch that the answer to all our questions lie hidden in that old picture. Did all movie projectors make this racket ten years ago? Most of them, Patsy. Mm. Now, listen. You don't believe in our voodoo magic, eh? Well, if you've been here long enough to see some of the things I've seen. Really, Ross, there's something uncanny about these natives. Call it coincidence if you like. Who's the woman? Gosh, she's good at it. That's Lula Dore, the star of the picture Stone's shooting here now. Well, their voices sound funny and teeny. Yeah, they certainly do. It's easy enough to scoff when you've just come down from the States. But it is magic. There's no other way to explain some of the things that happened. Magic, mumbo jumbo, you mean? You'll never convince me it's anything else. I suppose this is another of those wild dances. Now, there's a really good voice. Who is he, Nick? Now, don't tell me you don't remember him, Patsy. Uh -uh. The name was Bart Tyson, great leading man, ten years back. Oh, I remember his name, of course. This is rather better than most of the dances I've seen. Patsy, I've heard that voice very recently. You must be almost over now, Nick. Have you discovered anything? I'm not sure yet. Gosh, they had some pretty fancy photography in those days. I, I thought all that underwater swimming stuff was comparatively new. Oh, no. Stone was the first person to use it. Well, how did they do it? Look at that man swimming. It couldn't be faked. It isn't. It was taken through some sort of a glass tank. That native has been underwater for 20 minutes. No human can hold his breath that long. That's what I've been telling you, Ross. They're magic, these natives. Magic. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. That voice. I've heard it somewhere before myself. I never heard Tyson act before. Hey, don't we see the ending? No, nope. that's all they made, Patsy. The picture wasn't finished. Well, did you find out what you wanted to? I'm not quite sure. Well, Mr. Carter, did you like the picture? Oh, a very interesting stone. Oh, well, that Lula Dory certainly is beautiful, isn't she, Mr. Stone? I've never seen her in pictures before. Has she done anything else? No, nothing. Until now that she's starring in my new show on Broadway. That's funny. I think with her looks and her voice, she'd be a sensation. Mm, that's what I've always claimed. But, well, she got scared off after all these things happened during the filming of this one. And, well, she's stuck to Broadway ever since. 
And when Tyson, her leading man, was hurt, she rather felt... Oh, I was wondering what happened to Tyson. From what I could gather from this show, he should have been a natural for talkies. Oh, he was. But we had a bad explosion, and his whole face was terribly scarred. That's why we could never finish this picture. He never could act in pictures again. Oh, what a shame. Well, Stone, thanks for showing us the film. Mind if we scout around after Riley? Oh, no, not at all. If you need me, I'll be on stage three. We're going to start shooting soon. Good. It's funny about Doré. She seems to be cropping up in our lives all over the place. Yes, she does, doesn't she? Patsy, if you find a telephone, get hold of Scubby. Mm-hmm. Find out what you can about Bart Tyson and what's happened to him since the accident. Okay, Nick. Where'd you be? If I don't see you before, I'll meet you at Stone's office at noon. Right. Oh, Nick! Nick Carter! Oh, Riley. Just looking for you. You found anything yet? Yeah, we found all the weapons from that voodoo movie. All except the ones we'd already found, that is. How'd you know you found them all? Uh, Stone had an inventory. We checked on it. Well, if your theory about Stone's correct, Riley, he could have falsified that inventory. Uh, well, why should he? Well, perhaps he had a couple of weapons hidden somewhere and doesn't want us to know anything about them. Nick, the, the, the more I think about it, the less I like that guy. <laughs> Find anything else? No, 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 not a blessed thing. Search the whole lot of you? All but stage nine over there. That's locked up tighter than a drum. I can't pick locks the way the great Carter does. Okay, I'll take care of those. Uh, Riley, why don't you go on down to stage three? They're going to start shooting the picture pretty soon, and I'd feel a lot more comfortable if someone were on guard there. We've had enough murders for one day. I suppose you think this is a gag, having us get all dressed up like merry villagers or something. It's not a gag, Patsy. It's insurance. What do you mean? Just what I said. When we're dressed up in our regular clothes, everybody in the lot knows who we are. But anyone seeing us dressed up like this will think we're actors and never look at us twice. I never thought I'd live to see the day when people wouldn't stare at Nick Carter, master detective, all dressed up in knee pants. Quiet. Did you check with Scubby? Yep. But just as Stone said, Tyson was hurt in that explosion and then just sort of vanished. Hasn't been heard of since. Hmm. That takes care of that. Well, here's stage nine. The only place that hasn't been searched either by Riley or me. What do you expect to find? I don't know. It's funny, this door isn't locked. Everything else in the lot has been. Yes. Riley distinctly said it was locked when he tried it. Well, keep your eyes open. There may be a reason for it being open now. Golly, it's dark inside here. Here. Take this flashlight. Okay. I've got another. Hey, Nick, look. There's an old makeup table. I wonder what kind of makeup they used in those days. Patsy, we haven't time to stop for you to look at makeup. Look here. Why, this makeup isn't old at all. What's that? No, this is the very latest type of movie makeup, and it's all new stuff. Well, good for you, Patsy. Yes, there's something funny about this. Definitely, Nick. But this panchromatic makeup wasn't developed until Technicolor came in. They didn't use this type of makeup back in the days when this studio was in use. Somebody must have been here since. And none of the actors are making up way over here. Right, Patsy. I'll make a detective out of you yet. Now let's see if we can find anything else. Oh, I'm getting creeps, Nick. I don't like it here. Patsy, I think we're getting warm. This is one of the first real clues with... Hey. Hmm? Recognize that? Wait. Well, that must be the glass tank they used to take that swimming sequence in the voodoo movie. Right you are. I wonder why they left it half full of water this way. When they finished taking that scene, they probably just walked off and left it here. Maybe. Don't forget they closed this place in a hurry. What are you doing? Patsy, this water is fresh. What? It'd be stale if it had been here ten years. Stale and smelly. Say, I'm beginning to think maybe Stone's right and there is a hex on this place. Too bad that voodoo picture wasn't in Technicolor. Those colored stones at the bottom of the tank would have showed up beautifully. They are beautiful, aren't they? Yes, you bet. Hey, Patsy. What? Look here. Those aren't just colored stones. They're... Douse your lights, Patsy, quick. We've got callers. Tuck back here behind this crate. Why the boss always swipes such important rocks? Why didn't he settle for just a small fry? The the men we're after. Big time, that's why. You've got enough dough to pay all the bills until that stuff cools off. And when it's safe to handle it, he'll smuggle it out of the country and sell it for plenty. What's he leave it lying around here for? Hidden in the old equipment. Now, now we know why boy was killed. Thought anybody ever come back here. Gosh, when that punk went into that storehouse, I bet he saw the works. Uh, he did. The boss spotted him going in and just had time enough to get that knife and come back and nail him. 
And a kid was dashing back the stone to spill the beans. Gee, your boss is sure lucky. He ain't lucky. He's smart. He had Lippy planted up on that catwalk just in case somebody got an idea to go into that electrician's storeroom. And somebody did. Just in That here. takes brains to know that. Well, we better get going, huh, Jake? Yeah, you start draining the tank so we can get the rocks. I'll get the makeup stuff. Why is he moving everything out now? Hey, he figures it'll cool off by now, and with the stuff he's going to lift from that Doray dame this afternoon. I think I'm going to scream. Hold it, Patsy. Oh, oh. Who's that? Hey, look. Over there, Jake. Two guys. Only come here. Run for it, Patsy. Run, run where? Let go of me, you... Let her go, you lousy rat. Get away. Let her go, you Let me let her go. Hey, I'll handle it better. You want to get the fuck you handle that guy, sir? Hey, get the fuck off me. I got to get rid Uh, guess that'll hold him. Oh, Gosh, on? it took three of us to knock him cold. He a fighter or something? Hey, hey, I know him. It's Nick Carter, the dick. Well. Nick Carter? Hey, and a good-looking doll. Well, it's a good thing you called me in time. Now, what are we going to do with them now that we got them, huh? We can't just sleep them lying around. Somebody's bound to notice them. Hey, the fish tank. Yeah, that's right. We'll throw them in there. Then when they're good and drowned, we'll drain the tank and get them and the other stuff out at the same time. Good idea, Lippy. Okay. Here, Pete, you lift the lid. You shove the girl in, Lippy. All right. Jake and I will dump that Carter guy in. It'll be a real pleasure to do something like this to a copper. Yeah. Come on. Hey, go Ready? Ahead. Go ahead. Put Carter in first. Okay. Here he goes. Happy swimming, Carter. Yeah. <laughs> Now dump the dame in, Jake. In you go, lady. Ah, that's okay. Uh, hey, listen, guys. Suppose they get out. We'll see that they don't get out. Stokey, huh? Put the lid down on the tank. Okay, Jake. And I'll put this padlock on, and they're safe as if they was in jail. <laughs> that's good work. Hey, hey, look, boys, they're coming too. So what? Who cares now? Yeah, who cares? Lippy, huh? turn on the water. Okay. Here she comes, Jake. Get those two baby spots set up there, will you? Is this what you want? Ah, uh, that's better. Now, uh, open number two a little more. Okay. All right, this is the take. Ready? Ready. All set. Lights. Camera. All right, action, Miss Dory. It was when I first opened your letter that I knew at last. As I opened the... No, 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 Lula, darling. Mean what you say. Remember, your lover has returned. Now, this is your big moment. Now, relax. Take it easy. Now, now, come on. Once more. All right, action. Come on. It was when I first opened your letter that I knew at last. As I opened the envelope, even before I read the words that you'd written there, I realized that what I'd hoped for so long had at last... <laughs> Hey, hey, what's the matter with those lights? Why aren't they... Turn on those lights. I'm in charge here. There'll be no confusion. Quiet, everybody. Quiet. The masked man. Who are you to tell me under the light on this phone? This is a hold-up. A hold-up. Oh, Look here, you. You can't pull a hold-up. Quiet, I said. Quiet if you don't want a bullet hit you. Quiet. 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 The man's mad. That's better. Now, nobody will get hurt if you just keep quiet and do as you're told. Turn on that spotlight. Okay, boss. That's it. Now, all of you, line up against the wall there. Come on, get moving. I don't want to shoot, but I will if you make me. And shut up. Uh, you can't tell me to shut up. That order includes you, know. you too, Riley. Now, don't forget that although you can't see me with this spotlight shining in your eyes, I can see you very clearly. Now, each one of you in turn will step forward and put your valuables on that table and center stage. And don't try to hold out on me or it'll be bad for you. All right. We'll start with a star performer, Miss Lulu Doré. Please, Miss Doré, if you think I can't see her trying to hide behind the drapes over there, you're wrong. You're in this too. 
Your jewels, please. No. No, not my emeralds. Surely you won't... Surely I will. It's those emeralds I'm particularly interested in. You don't think I care for the little wristwatches and pocketbooks I'm going to get from the rest of these people, do you? But you can't mean to take my emeralds. One more word out of you and I'll come after them myself. And if I do it... Stand where you are, Tyson. I've got you covered. Nick Carter! Nick! Please be! Is that you? Come and get me, Carter. Watch him, Ali, if you can. Turn the lights on, Patsy. Right, Nick. Here they are. There he goes, Nick! I missed him, darn it. Did you see where he went, Nick? There he goes, Mr. Carter, climbing up the climbing up the catwalk. Tyson, come down from there or I'll shoot. You haven't got a gun, Nick Carter. Yours is too wet to shoot after your little swim. But I've got my gun. Here! You missed me, Tyson, but I won't miss you. You may not know it, but my guns are absolutely waterproof. Oh! Nice work, Carter. You shot the gun right out of his hand. And now your gun's gone, Tyson. Come on down. Yeah? Come up here and get me. You haven't caught me yet. So long. Oh, look at him run. He should make a misstep or lose his balance up there. He'd fall off and get a... Tyson! Tyson, stop! Stop! Look out! You don't slip there! Nick! He lost his balance! Watch out, Tyson! Oh! Say you want us to drop you at headquarters, Riley? If you will, Nick. Okay. You men get the rest of Tyson's gang, all right? He did. They're coming right behind us. Was Tyson badly hurt from his fall? Oh, no, not much. Just a broken ankle. He'll be all right. <laughs> all right, that is, until he gets to the electric chair. Oh, Nick, when I think of how close we came to drowning, I'm scared all over again. Hey, how did you say you got out of that tank, Nick? Believe it or not, Lieutenant. He cut a piece of that heavy glass with a diamond in his ring. Well, what do you know? But, but look, if it was as easy as all that, well, what took you so long doing it, Nick? I had to wait until the thugs got out of the room. Then I just cut a nice little circle out of the glass right beside where the padlock was, reached out, and picked the lock. All very simple. Uh, simple for you, maybe. Not for me. And you say you found the jewels Tyson had stolen in the bottom of the tank, eh? Yes, Riley. What Patsy and I thought were pretty colored stones. Turned out to be all the jewels Tyson had stolen during the last ten years, all unmounted and dumped in with the pebbles in the tank. But what made you first suspect Tyson, Nick? Well, Patsy, it was his voice first. Remember I told you after we saw him in the movie that I knew I had heard his voice somewhere very recently? Oh, so that's why that voice sounded so familiar. Can you imagine that? A movie star turned crook. Then there was the fact that Tyson had faded so completely out of sight after his accident. That looked fishy to me. No great star would have let his career be ruined without bringing a suit of some kind. Unless he had some plans of his own. And from what I learned from Scubby, we realized he never had brought suit. Yes, and a suit like that would have made all the tabloids. But how did you know Tyson and the watchman were the same? I didn't, Patsy. Until you found that makeup kit. That panchromatic makeup is often used to cover scars. And then I remembered the scarred gateman. It fitted. So did his voice, and the fact that he had the only remaining set of keys to the lot. And, of course, he had all the opportunity in the world. But I bet you didn't realize that the murders were tied up with the robberies. Not until we heard those crooks talking, I mean. Well, the makeup kit told me that, too. Remember, Patsy, how you always claimed that all those robberies were done by individuals, not a gang? Yes, but I still don't well, see Well, Tyson that. was a consummate actor, and he had complete knowledge of makeup. He disguised himself as a different character, I imagine, for each robbery. Evidently, he played his role expertly, since he succeeded in giving the impression that different people were committing the various thefts. But say, if that makeup was so good, why couldn't he have gone back to the movies instead of turning thief? Well, Riley, it was good enough for dim lights, but not for the sharp eyes of the camera. Oh, I see. Poor fellow. What an end for a great star. Yes. The explosion probably injured his mind, too. One more thing, Nick. How did he get to be caretaker? Oh, I asked Stone that. He said he felt sorry for the man and had given him the job out of kindness. Oh. Well, that's all over now. Except that from now on I'm allergic to water anywhere, except in drinking glasses. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Glass Coffin, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Voodoo Curse. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. 
And now, Nick, will you tell us something about your story for next week? Well, next week we leave this part of the country and are going out west to the mining districts of Montana. Did you go too, Patsy? Yes, I went along. But Nick and Scubby did most of the work and had most of the excitement. I just stayed in the hotel and waited. Yes, that was the first case that Scubby and I really worked out together. And before they were through with it, Scubby very nearly went crazy, literally. And Nick just missed being buried alive. You see, it started out to be a case of robbery. But it ended up with at least two murders and more excitement than I've had in a long time. Well, I hope it's as good as it sounds. It's better. But more of that next week. So long. So long, folks. We'll be seeing you. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In The Strange Adventure You've Just Heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Nancy and Jean Webb. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at this same time, another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Flying Duck Murders. Or Nick Carter and the Mysterious Gold Thieves. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. My name is Humphrey Davis. I've been playing the part of Lieutenant Riley in tonight's show. Just now, though, I'm speaking as myself. Actors, you know, appear at many war bond rallies. We like to know that what we can do may help in selling more bonds. But after all, selling more war bonds is everyone's business. You can talk to your friends about the third war loan campaign just as any speaker might. You know the reasons why we must buy extra bonds. You know how purchases of extra war bonds back the attack. You know that they're a great investment... And you know that giving up something you were planning to buy for yourself and buying war bonds instead isn't really any sacrifice. And as you think of these things, how about doing more in this third war loan yourself? Because you can't do too much for the men who are fighting for us every minute somewhere in the world. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Mutual.